Welcome into EP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update. I'm Rob Black. Joining me today is CFA, CFP, Director of Portfolio Strategy, Adam Phillips with EP Wealth. Let's do a December mid-market end of the year update. NASDAQ's up 38.6% for the year. The SP 500 up 20.4%. The Dow up 9.3, so there's a little bit of broadening out, a little bit better breath in the markets in the last six weeks. Of note, we are on a six-week win streak, which kind of coincides with a 10-year treasury going from around 5% down to where it is now at 4.2%. Let's talk about this and much, much more with Adam Phillips. Adam, year-to-date, pretty impressive numbers. A uh, pretty crazy run up on the 10-year treasury, pretty crazy run down on the 10-year treasury. What do you make of these markets as we are in mid-December? Yeah, hi, Rob. So I, I think what's most interesting over the last, call it month or you know four to six weeks, is that the breadth that we have seen, and a lot of it has been influenced by that sharp decline in the 10-year Treasury yield. You, you mentioned it went from about 5% down to close to about four and a quarter uh, as, we're, as we're recording this here. And so what that has done, and, and I think we talked about it a little bit last week, but it sparked this, what we call an everything rally. And so for so much of the year, I think the story was really the magnificent seven stocks, those yep. largest companies in the S&P 500 that were really doing a lot of the heavy lifting for the market. And so what we didn't see was breadth in those great returns that we were talking about when we were just citing the performance of the S&P 500. Now what we've seen is all of these companies and, and areas of the market that have been lagging for so long, they're really starting to, to come, come to life here. So to put some numbers around that, over the last month, we've seen the S&P 500 still do quite well. It's, it's returned about 4.5%. So that includes those magnificent seven sto uh, stocks, which account for about 30% of the market. If we look at the average stock, meaning the equal weighted index, all those 500 companies, but we put them on equal footing. So we're not too concerned about the influence that those larger magnificent seven mega cap tech companies have. The equal weighted index uh, has returned over 7% over the last month. And then uh, if you go below that to smaller companies, we look at the Russell 2000, the small cap index, and that has uh, actually returned double digits. So just over 10% over the last month or so. And so I think that's really what I'm taking away here is that we're finally seeing that breadth. And a lot of it has really been driven by that de sharp decline in U.S. Treasuries. And so I, I think it's really a nice way to finish the year if we can hold on to it. But uh, we're certainly seeing some evidence of this uh, Santa Claus rally as, as we move further towards year end. And you're my favorite strategist without saying, um, it goes without saying, but there are some other people that will sneak a peek and cheat on you and take an eyeball look. Liz on Sanders. Um, she said something really interesting. She said for 2024, look for companies that are profitable. So she brought up an index that's not widely known to you or not widely known to me and, and the, the home public, so to speak. Um, the S&P 600, 600, which is only profitable companies. Can you talk about the idea of investing in profitable companies in 2024? Maybe what the IPC, the Investment Policy Committee, has seen at EP Wealth. Um, because it seems pretty reasonable what she's had to say. Sure. Well, I, I guess let's let's start maybe from the beginning here and and just highlight the fact that there are different indices for different in, uh, asset classes and sometimes yep. multiple indices and, and benchmarks that we use. We use the the S and P five hundred as uh, as a reference for that the broad market, um, but there's also the Dow, even though it only includes thirty stocks. Um, but those are larger companies as well. There's the Russell one thousand. Uh, in the uh, in the small cap space, we we tend to focus on the Russell 2000. Uh, I just mentioned its strong performance of late. Lizanne Sand uh, Saunders at, at Schwab, she talked about the S and P 600, but they both measure smaller companies. That's right, and just in different ways. And and so, I think the reason that you that that she was focusing, um, I, I didn't hear her or see what she was um, uh, see the article uh, that that you mentioned, but. I think one of the reasons that a lot of people focus on the S&P 600 when they're investing is because, as you said, it, it does filter for only profitable companies. I will highlight the fact that one of the reasons small cap in general has underperformed this year, if you look at the Russell 2000 and why it's so interesting that it's actually done so well here over the last month, is because about 40% of the companies in the Russell 2000, that small cap index, are actually not profitable. 
And so they haven't been profitable when we're still in an, in a, an economic expansion. What does that mean when we actually fall on tougher times? And so I think that's probably what she was getting at is it that was. as as the you know as, as this Fed tightening that we've seen over the last eighteen months or so as as we start to see more and more of the of the impact on the broader economy on these companies who rely on uh, financing on on debt financing and and the S and smaller companies tend to use more floating rate debt and so they're likely to feel the impact from a lot of this uh, the, the the higher rates that we're seeing today. And so I, I think the the idea is that you want to focus on quality here, something we are already doing and we expect to continue doing into 2024. You want to focus on those companies that are generating free cash flow, that have healthy balance sheets, uh, that are profitable because we do expect that we do some see some cracks forming in the economy. We don't think that a recession is guaranteed, but we do think that you're going to want to focus on on. Um, on strength, on quality here, and and really pick your pick your spots because you don't want to go for just those fancy names or the high flyers because sometimes those aren't the best quality. And so I, I think that's why, as an investor, an index like the S and P six hundred, uh, which focuses on profitable companies, is is a is something that you want to be looking at as we get into the new year. Classy and wise answer, and I want to remind our home viewers. You didn't know that question was coming and what an answer. You are the top pro. I love it. Um, now, cracks in the economy, you alluded to that that turn of a phrase. Last week, we saw the jobs report come out on Friday, the first Friday of every month. Um, was last Friday? Yeah, yeah. Um, when I saw the first number, I was like, uh-oh, um, it's too strong of a number. Fed's not going to like that. Causes inflation. But as the day went on, the story kind of changed. What did you see in the jobs number? Well, the number itself was was certainly stronger than expected. What we saw was about 200,000, so 199,000 net new jobs added in the month of November. So that came in stronger than expected. A lot of this was um, some of the, the give back from the, the losses that we saw in the prior month due to the, uh, the UAW strikes. And so now that those are over, um, we saw some of that come back. We did see that, you know, it's still, I, I think it says that the that the jobs market is still very strong. We're not seeing, we're seeing companies on uh, overall on net continue to to hire. So we're not seeing mass layoffs. And, and so maybe it tells the Fed, the economy and, and the jobs market is still relatively strong. We saw the unemployment rate dropped from 3.9 to 3.7%. And so... I think that that tells you that they don't necessarily have to cut rates too aggressively um, for at, at least right now. Uh, you know, what, one of the things I will mention is that it, it really depends on what job indicators you're looking at. So there were other pieces of data that we got earlier in the week, the JOLTS number, which is the job openings and labor turnover right. survey. And uh, th there, so, so this is a monthly figure as well. It's not quite as timely, but I think it is helpful to look at other types of data. And so one of the things that I saw there was that the quits rate, meaning how many how many um, employees are actually voluntarily leaving their jobs, uh, that number it, it continues to be, um, I guess, relatively low. Uh, it's been low over the last few months. And what that tells me is that when the jobs market, you know, you you rewind the clock uh, to you know last year, the you know, say several months before that. We saw the jobs market was extremely tight. It was extremely favorable to uh, to job candidates or or uh, or current employees. They felt like they could quit their job and easily go find another job that paid them more. And so the fact that the the quits rate has fallen, um, it, it tells me that maybe company uh, the, these employees don't necessarily think the grass is is so much greener on the other side. That they say, you know what, I have a secure job. Let's just stick where I am. And so I think that is telling. The other thing that we got last week on Thursday was continuing jobless claims. So those uh, who are receiving unemployment benefits that still haven't been able to find a new job, that number's at about a two-year high. And so I think there are some things that we want to monitor here. But for now, on the overall employment, that that jobs report that we got last Friday, which is very important, I think it tells you that we're, we're not at a point where we're going to see uh, mass layoffs, uh, I'd say anytime too soon, uh, the on a three year trailing, or excuse me, the three month trailing average, we're seeing about 200,000 jobs being added every month. That's still pretty healthy. And so there's a ways to go before we st uh, we start to see um, the net lay uh, layoffs. That would be obviously a, a something that, that the Fed needs to, to watch and guard against. 
I think the only component that you missed there was the wages. They were a little yeah. softer than expected. Yeah. And that's kind of Goldilocksian, my favorite, you know, burglar of bears. Um, it's not too hot, not too cold, but the wages came down a little bit. Is that right? Did I read that correctly? Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, we, we did see average hour, uh, the average hourly work week tick up which you know maybe speaks to the strength of the jobs market and I but I, again I think that was part of that was the the give back from the prior month where we saw uh, the average hourly work we come down again probably influenced uh, largely by the strike and so now that that's over we we saw that added back and and so there's you know I, th I think there's a lot to kind of dissect there but on the whole I, I think the the takeaway is that the jobs market is still relatively strong here i.e. A lot of talk about soft landing off that jobs report. Now let's take a look at some economic data this week. Um, Tuesday and Wednesday, we get some information. The year is winding down. So this may be the last look into inflation for us as far as I can see. Um, what are you expecting from CPI on Tuesday and PPI on Wednesday? Or is PPI not important? I think PPI is very important. It okay. tells you what what the the companies themselves are paying and what they may be passing through to the to their to their customers to to consumers um, and and other businesses. So I, I think it is important, but I think CPI really gets a lot of the attention, and uh, you know, rightfully so. It is the the consumer price index, so the broad measure of inflation. I think it's going to continue to trend lower, but it's still much higher than the Fed wants it to be, right? I think that's the takeaway is that we've seen a lot of progress from when CPI middle of last year was at 9%. We've seen it come down you know, quite a bit. It's still going to be north of 3%, whether you're looking at that headline overall figure or the, what they call the core figure, which excludes food and energy prices that tend to be more volatile. That number could be closer to you know, the high threes. Um, so we'll see where they come in. But I think that the fact remains that it's still higher than where the Fed wants it to be, although the trend uh, is certainly a, a plus. Now, I think what, what we're going to continue hearing about is this what they call the last mile of inflation, right? I think the easy job is is over, getting inflation from nine to, to three percent, right? I, I think that's been really easy because we saw how aggressively the Fed responded to the situation by by raising rates the way they did. Now I think we're we're going to be in a in a trickier spot because inflation is you know it's going to be around three percent the target's closer to two percent and so I think this kind of begs the question does the the Fed stay on hold and and just allow this uh, is this trend going to remain intact if they just kind of stay on hold and and do nothing or do they need to start cutting in anticipation that a lot of the uh, monetary tightening that we've seen over the last several months still hasn't actually been felt in the economy, right? And so I, I think this is going to be the debate that goes on uh, for uh, for the, the, the weeks and months to come. But uh, I, I think it's going to be an interesting time. But I, I would not expect a, uh, and, and I certainly wouldn't hope for an upside surprise in inflation, um, because I think that would just kind of complicate the narrative here. But but I, I certainly think that Tuesday's report is going to be important. Okay. And let's kind of wrap this all up with the Fed. And it all ties together. The jobs report from last week, the CPI and PPI this week, inflation, jobs and inflation. The Federal Reserve, their job seems to be two mandates, fight inflation or keep inflation low, 2% range, and keep employment full. I don't know what that really means. Um, you probably have a better idea of it. But we get the Fed this week, last Fed meeting of the year. We're putting a lot of you know speculation into what they're going to do next year. Um, what do you expect their statement um, to be thrown down as? And I guess we also get a, a Chairman Powell uh, co press conference as well this week. We do, we do, and and so it's I, I'd say it's just about everyone is is expecting them to continue with a, with a third straight pause here. And okay. so I, I guess if. If the Fed pauses, you know, once or twice, it can be considered temporary. If they pause three times straight, then I, I think then it, it it's quite likely that we've seen the um, we we've seen the end of these rate hikes, and so the next step would be a move lower in in rates. And so we are going to uh, hear from Jay Powell following the conclusion of the FOMC meeting, which is a, it's a two day two day meeting that ends on Wednesday. We're also going to get the summary of economic projections, which includes their projections for things like the inflation rate, the uh, unemployment rate. We're also getting the dot plots where they, uh, which provide us with the median projections of, from those on the Fed who, uh, of where rates are going over the next year and, and 2025. I think all that is going to be really, really important. You know, I, I, I think 
what what Jay Powell is likely going to do is uh, he doesn't want to sound too dovish, meaning that he doesn't want to uh, show his hand, even if he he can you know see his hand himself. I'm not quite so sure that that he can, but. I don't think that they want to come out too dovish and then the market says, OK, great, the Fed's going to cut rates aggressive, uh, aggressively. Then that sparks a, you know, a stock rally. It, it gets people to um, to go out and spend. It could incre- uh, create inflationary pressure. Um, I think he's going to come out more hawkish and say things are going really, really well. Let's just continue to take the data as it comes and, and be open to possibly cutting rates uh, a couple times next year. I think that's a you know the the better way to do it because you you acknowledge the progress that we've seen, but you don't show your cards and you kind of keep an open mind and and because we know that the data can change on you, and so I, I think that's what we're going to hear on Wednesday. Um, obviously, the you know the market uh, and investors interpret it the way that they want, right? They they hear it through through their own ears, and and so we'll see how they interpret the message. That's what I'm hoping the message is. Um, the, the market is pricing in four cuts next year, which I think is is quite aggressive. And I would hope that Jay Powell finds a way to um, to reset expectations uh, among investors that maybe four cuts is kind of aggressive. And that implies that the economy isn't doing so hot. So careful what you wish for. Um, so you know, I, I think that's why this meeting is important. It's 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 a chance to reset expectations with investors, hear directly from the Fed and and from the the Fed chair. Uh, so th- I think that's going to be interesting. And and just to kind of um, belabor the point, you know, a, a little bit more. I mean, the the Fed, as I said before, when talking about inflation, I, I think it's really that last mile that's the most difficult. When you know, back when inflation was so high, it was really easy for the Fed to to find consensus and say, "Yeah, inflation's a problem. Let's let's raise rates." I think from here on out, it's going to be a little bit trickier because what the Fed is, you know, the, the Fed faces the challenge of do they uh, do, do they not cut rates? Um, if they don't cut rates aggressively enough, then maybe as this policy is felt in the economy as as uh, as, as the months go on we risk going into a recession. Now, if they cut rates too aggressively and they provide, they they take their foot off, let's say the economic brake pedal, then that could actually reinflate the economy and, and cause inflation to come back. That would damage their credibility. We've seen in the past um, that the Fed has actually declared victory too soon. They ended up cutting rates and inflation came back with a vengeance. It was even worse than before. And so I think that's what they are very mindful of and want to avoid. And so it's going to be really, really tough. I mean, they're walking a tightrope right now. And so I, I think these next year is certainly going to be interesting where every meeting is what they call a live meeting for potentially a move. And so it's going to be really, really uh, important. Um, so anyway, that's what's on my mind when it comes to uh, this uh, this week's FOMC meeting. To belabor your belabored point, um, if you go check out a Google, a 10-year chart of inflation in the 1970s, You'll see exactly what Adam's talking about as far as inflation. It seemed like it was contained and then bam, it sparked one more time. So wise and salient points for sure, Adam. Thank you very much. We have a lot to look forward to next year. Maybe next week, I'll press you a little bit on 2024 housing, 2024 markets, people like that end of the year kind of prediction stuff. But that he is Adam Phillips, CFA and CFP Director of Portfolio Strategy, DP Wealth. As always, a reminder, good time to check in with your wealth advising team. End of the year, a lot of planning to get done. Check out our website, epwealth.com. A lot of new content added every couple of weeks there. I'm Rob Black for EP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update. Good day.